Today's episode of Expanded Perspectives is sponsored by Gaia.com. Help find your own truth by exploring perspectives you won't find in the mainstream on some of life's biggest mysteries. Whether it's grand conspiracies, breakaway societies, UFOs, ancient civilizations, lost wisdom, as well as the paranormal all at your fingertips. Stream videos anywhere from your living room or on the go with the Gaia app available through the App Store or Google Play. You'll have access to over 7,000 titles all available to you with a monthly plan for only $9.95 a month. If you sign up now, your first month is only 99 cents. There are multiple plans to choose from, including a three-month plan and an annual plan. Gaia has one-of-a-kind shows like Truth Hunter, Buzzsaw, Cosmic Disclosure, Beyond Belief, Missing Links, Hidden Origins, and Deep Space, Unearthing Nazca, and False Flags. Gaia is available on your Android or iPhone, Roku, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire TV. If you enjoy expanding your perspective, then you'll enjoy Gaia.com. G-A-I-A dot com slash expanded perspectives. All one word. G-A-I-A dot com slash expanded perspectives. Hey there, y'all, and thanks again for joining us here on Expanded Perspectives. That's right. It's me, your host, Cam. And joining me, as always, sitting across the table from me, the Parker County Paralyzer, the Dub City Demon, the Great Beast himself, is Kyle Filson. How's it going, everybody? I'm glad to be here in studio on a hot Texas day. <laughs> Excited, folks. Uh, watching the fights last night with Cam at my house. Very interesting. Uh, there's a lot of good fights. I had, a, I had a great time. I also saw some juggling last night. I witnessed some juggling. Uh, well, at least Luke was calling it juggling. I'm not exactly sure what he was juggling, but I Play witnessed some. He was Play Doh juggling. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's some good fights, but yeah, yeah. All in all, it was a great weekend. I think Luke's going to grow up to be a Bigfoot hoaxer because I already see he likes to get Play Doh and he and he rolls it out and then he likes to get his dinosaurs or whatever characters and he likes casting footprints in the Play Doh. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm on to him. <laughs> He's going to be a Bigfoot hoaxer. He's going to be making those fake footprints and making plaster molds and then trying to pedal them out on the you know the interstate or something down by the. The big thicket forest. <laughs> I've heard parents talk about what they think their kids are going to be, but never a Bigfoot Not hoaxing, a Bigfoot hoaxer? Uh, 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 Footprint print peddler that's that's well, that's a hell of a thing you know there's probably not a whole lot of five-year-old kids whose fathers are constantly are talking about sasquatch yeti bigfoot i mean luke knows about all of them he's well versed in it <laughs> and his brothers are well versed in the wear man i do know one other kid that is around five years old that's well versed in cryptozoology and that's lila yeah uh, lila yes. blackburn yeah yeah we went over there to lyle's and sandy's <laughs> house one time uh because he doesn't live that far from us about 45 miles but uh we were over there one time, and, and, and Lyle has an incredible museum at his house of just all, you know, the, the famous Hollywood horror movies. And Lila, you'd think it would be scary for a little kid to be in there, but, it, she, you know, she grew up around it. It doesn't bother her one bit. She'll Not just go in there. And she knows all the cryptozoology animals. She was telling me about Nessie. She was telling me about the chupacabra. I mean, it's just, it's common knowledge. Yeah. It's the same way Luke is. 
What's funny is, oh, yeah, that, well, she was at like the Texas Frat Fair or the Frat Fest or whatever. This little girl, she's adorable. She's walking around and all these get people, like, instead of the cosplay, it's all like the horror actors. Like, you look like you got Pinhead, yeah. all this stuff. She doesn't even bat an eye at it. Doesn't, she's just like, eh, eh. When it comes to Luke, he's, he's things that scare him is all relative to how big it is. For example, he'll watch, like, Michael Jackson Thriller when he transforms into a werewolf mm -hmm. on my iPhone. He's even He even likes to watch American Werewolf in London. Where David changes into a werewolf on yeah. the iPhone, but if I put the same thing, like if I airplay it to the big sixty-inch TV, he don't like it. He will. He'll run out of the room screaming. He will not stand for it. But then you give him right back on the phone. He loves it. So it's all relative to the size of the image. I, I don't like know what that. that is. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start the news, folks. Check this out. Speaking of our buddies, this comes from our uh, our friend Nick Redfern, and he posted a pretty interesting uh, article over on Mysterious Universe's blog. About how from 1982 to 1983, there was a wave of sightings in England of what is believed to be a real-life cam, get this, pterodactyl. Oh, awesome. The strange sightings occurred in an area called the Pennines. The first encounter occurred at a place with the highly apt nickname of the Devil's Punch Bowl on September 12, 1982. That was when a man named William Green came forward with an astonishing story of what he encountered at Shipley Glen Woods. He said it was a large, gray-colored creature that flew in a haphazard style, which possessed a pair of large, leathery-looking wings. Now, he wasn't the only one. Seventy-two hours later, a woman named Jean Schofield had the misfortune to see the immense beast at the West Yorkshire town of Yaden. That the thing was headed for the Leeds Bradford Airport provoked fears in Schofield's mind of a catastrophic mid-air collision between a passenger plane and this giant mighty-winged thing she was seeing. She said that the local media soon heard of the sightings, and the story was given pride of place in the newspapers of the day. Now, while the theory that a large bird of prey had probably escaped from a menagerie or a zoo satisfied many skeptics, it did not go down well with the eyewitnesses. They were sure that what they encountered was not a giant bird, but something straight out of the Jurassic era. The media attention soon brought forth additional witnesses, including Richard Pollock, who claimed he and his dog, Cam, had been dive-bombed by the monster, <laughs> which descended on the pair with alarming speed. He said it also was screaming as it did so. Pollock hit the ground, protecting his dog, and he said given the fact that the creature was practically on top of him, Pollock couldn't fail to get a good look at it. He described it as reptilian and with a face that looked like a cross between a crocodile and a bat. That's what I want to fly in crocodile. That sounds awesome. Right? It says, then there was somewhat of a lull in reports, but they exploded again in the month of May of 1983. There was a sighting at Thackley on May 6th by a witness whose attention to the creature was provoked by the sudden sound of heavy wings beating above. Yet again, it was a case that not only caught the media's attention, but provoked several other witnesses to come forward. One of them was a Mr. Harris who said that on November 1977, at Totley, he saw such a giant flying monster that looked like a giant pterodactyl soaring overhead. He also said it was growling as it did so. He was adamant that what he saw was a full-blown pterodactyl. After that sighting, the wave just stopped and nothing else was ever seen again. So, what was this wave of sightings between 1982 and 1983 in the English countryside? I think that's very bizarre, right? Yeah, but I just I like the descriptions because it's not a lot of like what we hear. Yeah, very interesting, and it's also an example that that's not only happening in Chicago, yeah, yeah. or you know West Virginia or other places like that. It's actually occurring in many countries all over the world, yeah. including the UK. Right? Can you? I, mm. Which we have lots of UK listeners. We love you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, watch out. You don't want to make sure you have a flying crocodile <laughs> in the air up around y'all. Yeah, that would be a, the best way to ruin your underwear while you was on your way to work. That's have right. that yeah. swoop down on you. Uh, I think this is interesting. So this is why I decided to share this is because we talk about wind farms. We talk about a lot of these different things because, you know, you, you want to strive to try to break away from fossil fuels or at least do your best to help this out. So futurism.com had this little old nugget. It, and it's very, very, I guess, it's something that it makes me happy. It lets me believe that we're, we're making a few steps in the right direction. And it says South Miami approved legislation that any new residential building project must have a solar energy aspect. 
That's good. Yeah, right. And that says this is a major advancement in a state that has long and complex history with renewable energy. Now, this is get, Now, we don't mean like this coming up. We're talking like right now, bro. From mid-September onward, solar panels will be mandatory for new homes in South Miami, Florida. The law, which was passed, they said, to a, by a four to one majority. Now, get a load of this. It states that builders must install if, if there's an area that's over, say, a thousand square foot square, you know, a thousand square foot of living space, it has to have a, a certain size solar panel. And roughly it's, it's what it reads here is a hundred and seventy five square foot solar panel per every one thousand square foot of sunlit roof area or one panel with a certain capacity, a two point seven five kilowatt capacity for every thousand foot of living space is kind of what they've done. And they said this is even going to extend into renovations and remodels. So if you renovate or remodel a certain size uh, add-on to your house down there, you're going to have to add this solar panel, which they believe, you know, that they said, and even in the article it talks, they believe that it shows that South Miami is trying to, to move towards a clean energy future, but it's caused a little problems. Now, Philip Stoddard is the mayor, and he was interviewed by the Miami Herald, and he even had a quote saying that we're the first city in the United States outside of California to approve this. And he says that he knows it's not going to save the world by itself, but it's getting people, you know, to start thinking about this solar energy. The interesting thing, though, is there's caused a lot of controversy with some groups and it makes sense because they say it de-incentivizes new buildings. And by that, they're talking about that the implementing of these solar panels and requiring it to be done doesn't fall on the building companies, but or it does fall, I'm sorry, on the building companies and not the government covering the cost. So they're not going, you just have to install them because we're trying to better it. So it'd be like you're coming into the city, you're going to help the city out by easing up their power grid, but you're going to have to pay to do it. Right. Now, Eric Montes de Osha, was the president-elect of the Miami chapter of the Latin Builders Association, and he even argued to the Miami Herald that he says it, that the measure essentially means that anyone who does not want to have solar panels is not welcome to live in South Miami. And he says this, I would argue, runs counter to our individual freedoms. That's an angle I didn't think about. So if you wanted to move down there and build a home, but you didn't want to be solar, well, we don't care. You're not welcome here if you're not willing to do all that. So they did talk about that, that it joins, a, South Miami joins a number of U.S. cities that have implemented similar rulings. They said in January, San Francisco began enforcing a rule that buildings 10 stories or shorter would have to either have solar panels or water heaters, okay? Right. And then Lancaster in California passed measures to ensure that new houses are renewably self-sufficient. So there are towns out there that are reaching out more and more to this. I like the idea of it, but I also like the idea of maybe the city, let's say, assuming 50% of the responsibility, uh -huh. and let's say not requiring it. You know, let's not impinge on people. Let's not force them to do it. Let's incentivize them to do it. Let's give them breaks. Let's help them do it and not go, you're going to have to do this or we don't want you living here. Right. So, yeah, that's one of those things. But I do like the way that they're looking into let's let's get some more renewable energy. Let's clean this place up. Man, that is cool. There's an article I read over at the Washington Post uh, written by Stephen Petro. Pretty interesting about his mother. Uh, he talked about how his mother, as she was getting towards the end of her life, was starting to see ghosts and it freaked her out. And apparently this is quite common. In the article, he says, last summer, six months before my mother died, I walked into her bedroom and she greeted me with a tiny hello and a big smile. She then resumed a conversation with her mother, hmm. who had died in 1973. She said, where are you? My mom asked, as though grandma, a one-time Fifth Avenue millionaire, was on one of her many European hat buying junkets. As I stood there just dumbstruck, my mom continued chatting in a young girl's voice no less than for several more minutes. I instantly thought, was this the reaction of some of her medication, perhaps a sign of advancing dementia, or was she preparing just to transition to wherever she was going next? Regardless, my mom was freaking me out, as well as my brother, my sister, and my father. Well, as it turned out, my mother's chat with a ghost was a signal that the end was inching closer. Those who work with the terminally ill such as social workers and hospice caregivers, call these episodes or visions a manifestation of what is called nearing death awareness. A woman named Rebecca Vela, a psychiatrist in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, who specializes in treating terminally ill patients, recently told me that it's very common among dying patients in hospice situations for them to talk with dead loved ones. Those who are dying and seem to be in and out of it, or in and out of this world, 
and the next one often find their deceased loved ones present. They often communicate with them. In many cases, the pre-deceased loved ones seem, to the least to the dying person, to be aiding them in their transition to the next world. It says, while family members are often clueless about this phenomenon, at least at the outset, a small 2014 study of hospice patients concluded that most participants reported such visions and that at these people's, as they, as they approached death, they started having comforting dreams or visions of the deceased and they became more prevalent. Now, Jim May, a licensed clinical social worker in Durham, North Carolina, said that family members and patients themselves are frequently surprised by these deathbed visitors, often asking him to help them understand what was happening. He says, I really try to encourage people, whether it's a near-death experience or just a hallucination, to just go with the flow. He explained that after I told him about my mother's visitations, that whatever that the person that's nearing death is experiencing, it seems real to them. And they said, don't try to minimize, dismiss, or worse than that, try to tell your mom that she's not actually seeing this. Just let her think it is. Even if she's not, it seems to be helping, and it helps with dying people. They said there was even a moving 2015 TED Talk by a guy named Christopher Kerr, who's the chief medical officer at the Center for Hospice in Buffalo, New York. And he showed a clip on, of one of his terminally ill patients discussing her deathbed visions, which included her saying, my mom and my dad and my uncle and everybody I knew that was already dead was there by my side. I remember seeing every piece of their face. Now, the woman in the video was lucid and present and was not on any sort of medication. So isn't that very interesting? I've never heard of this, where as a person gets closer and closer to their death, they actually start having more and more visions of dead loved ones, almost as if the dead loved ones are coming to ease their transition into the next world. Now, like the article points out, is it really happening or is it merely a hallucination? But like we've talked about so many times with just psychedelic drugs, it doesn't matter if it's real or not. Mm -hmm. The experience for the person experiencing it is that it's real. Yeah. So either way, it has the same effect. Yeah, it could be real. It could be a dopamine dump like we've discussed. That's what they're talking about. That's yeah. what they're saying. You know, if, if you have a loved one that's experiencing don't try to dismiss it. Yeah. Don't try to go, no, you're not really seeing that. You're crazy. Let them think that they are. It, it's going to help them. I like the term. I think we're all this term. If you're listening to this, we're all predeceased. <laughs> <laughs> that's the term that I'm going by. What do you, you know, you're like, what's your, what's your title? Predeceased? I'm predeceased, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. But yeah, when you get to that point uh, with a loved one, I mean, we're all going to get to that point one day or another, whether it's real quick and painless or whether it's long and drawn out, we're all going to get to that point at one time or another. That's for sure. But I do like the idea of if you're supporting someone, if you have a family member like that, I like the idea of, of let them do it. You know, just let them just go with it. I mean, what's it, what's it going to hurt? Why would you argue with them with that whole thing? But uh, as long as we're going to be speaking about lifespans and things like that, I've got you something interesting here. Folks from Futurity.org. I know some of y'all don't like to go to the gym. Hell, I don't like to go to the gym. We don't want to take care of ourselves. But here's something for all of you that might want to just be a positive thinker, that if you're thinking you are not fit enough, that that might actually cut your lifespan. The merely the thought of it? Yes. New research finds that people who think they are less active than others in a similar age bracket die younger than those that believe they are more active, even if their actually activity levels are are similar or the same. So, yeah. And this is it. Aliyah Crum, assistant professor of psychology at Stanford University, says this. Our findings fall in line with a growing body of research suggesting that our mindsets, in this case beliefs about how much exercise we are getting relative to others, can play a crucial role in our health. Now, for this study, this is health psychology. These researchers analyzed surveys from more than, ready for this, mm -hmm. 60,000 U.S. adults from three national data sets. Now, the surveys documented participants' levels of physical activity, health, and personal background, among other measures. And in one of the samples, participants wore an, an, again, an accelerometer to measure their activity over a week. And the researchers were interested in one question in particular. Would you say that you are physically more active, less active, or about as active as other persons your age? Well, the researchers then viewed death records from 2011, which was 21 years after the first survey was conducted. 
Now, controlling for physical activity and using statistical models for that accounted for the age, body mass index, chronic illnesses, and other factors, they found that individuals who believed that they were less active than others were up to 71% more likely to die in the follow-up period than individuals who believed that they were more active than their peers. That's crazy. Yes. Now, Crum goes ahead to says, that, you know, it's basically stay aware of your movement. Said in an earlier study, they made a group of hotel room attendants aware that the activity they got at work met recommended levels of physical activity. Okay? Mm -hmm. So they told them, what you're doing meets the requirements. You know, everybody's like, you need to do at least this much. So they kind of placeboed them and said, what you're doing works great. They said through this shift in mindsets, the workers, many of whom had previously perceived themselves as inactive, experienced reductions in weight, in body fat, and a drop in blood pressure, among other positive outcomes. Blood pressure. That's right. <laughs> they said the mindset and perception may have a powerful effect on health because per perception can affect motivation and both positive and negative areas. Okay. Uh -huh. Now they bring up something and they talk about this. People that deem themselves unfit, they believe are more apt to remain inactive and unhealthy. You know, they're thinking, Oh, I'm way out of shape. Why would I do anything about it? Whereas if you start thinking, Hey, I'm doing better than I did yesterday. I'm doing better than I did last week. And you keep a positive outlook like you and I've talked about positivity. We don't like negativity in any aspect of our lives. No, I don't put we, up with it. I don't put up if, with it for the somebody show. No. It's negative around me. I just choose not to hang out with that exactly. person. Exactly. That's exactly right. That's kind of what they're getting at is, is use that positivity even, you know, and in, in what little workout you think you're getting, at least stay positive with it. And it's it's funny because they, I mean, they, they go into the whole thing and talk about the placebo, but there was a part of this that really hit me with this study. And it was talking about a s sexual behavior. And I say that because it's the idea. She's talking about the idea of a sexual contact with your partner mm -hmm. can stimulate and arouse you. Yeah. That same thing is how you look at working out. So um, an idea can have a physical reaction on your body. I totally believe that. So they're also leaning towards the fact that it will help you in your overall outcome. And, and this all goes back in when people say, just stay positive, just put out good vibes, good energy, be around positive people healthy it helps your your health but positive and healthy is going to add more years to your life all this makes sense it's things that's been talked about for a thousand years they're just now basically putting a scientific thumb on it and going yeah this yeah. is right this is all right i believe that totally i mean like i talk about it all the time whether what kind of doesn't matter what kind of mood you're in if you're on the phone and you're making a phone call if you force yourself to smile while you have that mm -hmm. conversation on the phone call it always sounds like you're more upbeat mm -hmm. even if it's totally fake Yes. Try to smile and talk and not sound upbeat. <laughs> yes. And you usually, you know, if you're talking to somebody, whether it's a client or at work or something like that, most of the times if you're really nice and you have a good attitude, you, you'd be surprised how much more work you can get done. Yeah. Than if you're just negative. Everybody knows that person in their life that's just negative about everything. About everything. And if you look at thing. it, most of the time their life is like a train wreck. And it's probably starting with them being negative all the time. It certainly seems that way. That does Obviously, it doesn't help. It doesn't help your... Your health, it doesn't help your mindset. So, yeah, of course. I totally believe that. Well, folks, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, I've got something interesting I want to tell you that happened to me a few, uh, maybe a week or so ago. Uh, I'm going to share with you all at the end of the show. But when we come back from the break, I want to talk about a certain vortices, something that's very interesting that I had forgotten all about until here recently. I want to share that with you all, folks. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives.
we are back. It is me with the Dub City Demon. And uh, he is over here pounding away on the keyboard. I'm not sure what he's working on over here now, but... Research. I'm going to make him stop. He's going to have to pay attention to these vortices I'm going to talk about, folks. I guess... <laughs> I guess I should, like all the other stories that I do, I should give y'all the background of how I decided upon this story. First of all, I was <laughs> was being my normal self, and late one evening, if that is normal, uh, and late one evening, I was searching online for any possible strange sightings off the coast of Destin, Florida. That's where it starts, because y'all know I'm silly like that, and it was <laughs> it was me worrying about where we're going to, I'm going to be down in a few weeks, you know, and like I told you early when I did the Bigfoot stories, I always like to go and look at local legend, local lore, and I was, I don't know why I kept thinking, man, what if there's like a ghost ship, you know, I kept thinking about that Chinese junk, and I'm just like, oh, what if I saw something like that, you know, one sunrise, I see some something crazy in the water, or I see something, you know, on the horizon, I, I don't know, just mind racing, but it was because of that, that I I stumbled across something that I had forgotten all about, and I'm actually kind of ashamed of myself that I wouldn't remember this because it was something I was hoping to talk with David Hatcher Childress about at the, the now non-existent Paradigm Syposnium, the paradigm, the paradigm. And uh, you said, like, why him? Why would you, what was you going to talk to him about, Cam? And I said, well, he, he wrote a book. It's called Mapping the World Grid. And in it, he speaks of this strange concept, and that concept is basically what I'm going to cover today. It's the ideal of what they call vile vortices. So to lay the groundwork for how this started, we have to go back to someone that most of us recognize as a cryptozoologist, and that someone is the late Mr. Ivan T. Sanderson. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know who he is and you love these topics, how dare you? How dare you? So... Ivan was born in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1911, and he is a very interesting fella. For, so for starters, his father was a professional whiskey distiller, and when Ivan was 14 years old, now he would travel with his father often, his father was gored to death by a rhinoceros while helping a film crew shoot a documentary in 1925. Yeah, mm. down in Kenya. So Ivan receives his BA in zoology, with honors, mind you, from Cambridge, and then it's where he later earned his M.A., and entomology and botany. Now, he traveled all the time and was part of dozens of expeditions. And one of these such trips is where his fascination for cryptozoology started, claiming he was attacked by a giant bat. Now, folks, I use the term cryptozoology with respect when I speak of Ivan because he's the man that coined the term cryptozoology. Now, he did so much work in these fields we all love and then he passed away from brain cancer in 1973. So it was during this lifetime of study and research that he got this idea that he believed could explain some of the strange occurrences that took place in certain areas of the world. Ivan believed that 12 vortices are situated along particular lines of latitude. Now this idea came from the writings of a fellow that lived back in history a ways. Now the man I'm referring to is named Plato. And he wrote about this subject back in the time, let's say, roughly between 427 and 347 BCE. Mm -hmm. Now, Plato theorized this, that the Earth's basic structure evolved from simple to complex geometric shapes. This is what he theorized. The cube, and then the tetrahedron, the three sides, then the octahedron, the eights, and then the Icosahedron, that's 20 sides, folks. And then it just goes to the deck to 12 sides. It goes all up. So it's, it's crazy. But basically, it's, it's Platonic studies is what it, we found out later scientifically. It's kind of what Plato had theorized. And that's, you know, what people believe is things that have happened. But he associated four of the five shapes with, respectively, the elements of earth, fire, air, and water. And he believed that the earth held this life-sustaining force inside it, this life's energy. And, and, and we've discussed it, you know, when people have talked about Nikola Tesla. Tesla believed that there was a free energy that came from the planet also or was in the universe. It's kind of one of those things, right? So you get this. Well, in the late 60s, Ivan Sanderson comes in. He's like, okay, you know, I'm going to have to. And he, now, mind you, he was avidly interested in investigating this stuff. And what got him on the path was ship and plane disappearances. That's what sent Ivan down this, was disappearing things like that. He's like, well, where do they go? 
And why do they seem to be in clusters, you know, lumping in clusters, much like when we talk about missing 411. So, like I said, in the late 60s, he starts looking into this stuff and he finds 10 areas that equidistant, equidistant that were approximately to him. And they were the subjects of these unexplained incidents. And he believed that it was due to and also to in these tales of things when he would read on them, an electromagnetic distortion. So that's kind of what got him going. So Ivan then theorized that undoubtedly there was cold air and hot air and sea currents were crossing these areas and that they might create this electromagnetic anomaly. And he believed that they could possibly be responsible for the disappearances of ships and planes and not just the disappearances, but that he believed that it also explained whenever they would have mechanical like instrument failure, Mm -hmm. any kind of mechanical problem. I haven't believed that. Well, in 1973, the Russians got involved. And you know when they get involved, things go wild, right? So we have three Russian or Soviet scientists. Valery Makhanov, uh, a Morikovov, and uh, a Nikolai Gonakarov. He was a great goaltender. Right, now, which is odd because it's V's. Who'd have never thought there was V's? And, but anyway, in their name. So they kind of compounded upon Ivan's theory. So they get in there and they're like, okay, you know. So you got to imagine, you know, like I told you, Ivan passes away in 73. These guys are like, oh, we're going to look into this. So they dig in and they really start building upon this. And these men go pretty deep in this. And they write an article called, Is the Earth a Large Crystal? And they publish it in a, in a scientific magazine over in the Soviet Union. And they theorized that it's a, that this is what they believe, uh, that a matrix, you ready for this? A matrix of cosmic energy makes up 12 pentagonal plates that cover the earth. That's what they, they claim. And in this article, they say that the junctions of any three of these plates, and they believe there's 62 junctions in all, possess unusual properties. And they said that it's such as advanced prehistoric cultures, unique wildlife, and other mysterious phenomena. So they believe that things were being built on these lines and in these junction points and that certain cultures knew of these things. So these, like I said, these Russian scientists, they outline a planetary grid that built on the original 12 of Ivan's vile vortices. And they overlap this 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 combination of, of his stuff with all these hedrons the dodecahedron all of these things they start and they're all in parallel with earth's seismic fracture zones so they're breaking it all down so like i said they go deeper into it so as they look they start looking at ocean ridges and they start looking at atmospheric atmospheric highs and lows on earth they start using the routes that they had back in 73 of migratory animals to start seeing how those lined up to these these overlapping areas and then they would start looking at where these locations of ancient civilizations that had been founded by then and using what they said was gravitational anomalies being built on there so they were looking at the movement of large stone okay Mm -hmm. so you get the idea of maybe that was what caused it you know to be why you build in a certain area because it was easier to move this these stones but those weren't the only russian scientists that got involved Later on, there was a, a, a physicist named Nikolai Kozarev and a Russian medical doctor named Alexander Tomanov. Now, Tomanov was inspired by Nikolai's work, and Tomanov had actually done some, some research in the field of human consciousness and magnetic fields. So he'd really done into a lot of this stuff. And so uh, Kozarev had made reproducible experience experiments in this. And his experiment was to prove the existence of a torsional energy field beyond the electromagnetism and gravity. And he said that it travels much faster than light in this, this field. Now this, another thing, Kyle, you and I, have, we've discussed this off air several times is this is some of the stuff they get back into when they had talked about the Nazi bell. Uh-huh. And they also talked about the fact of being able to not really teleport, but the fact that these uh, uh, unknown flying discs could move so fast and change directions so quick that it's not like a typical uh, motor or an engine as we perceive it, that it has to be something almost off an earth energy in order for it to move. That's kind of the, this torsional energy field as he's talking about. Well, Kozarev called it the flow of time. Now, Einstein also had some, and he called it the ether. Remember, and also others, it's also been discussed and called zero point energy. There's been a lot of these, these things along that. 
But Kozovev said that within this flow of time, this is what he believed, that the future, the past, and the present all exist at one time, that we're all basically stacked at one time in every place. That's what he believed. And he said that even more that, 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 that a man has access to it under the right conditions. So that kind of talk leads you to start thinking about time slips, that it's right beside you. And that's the reason you kind of blur over into it like we've discussed. And then he also believed that it also, when people start having these uh, psychic premonitions and being able to uh, uh, remote view that that's why is because you're in these areas to where the veil is the thinnest, you know, and what was the show that you and I was watching? Kyle, I always, I, 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 was it fringe? Yes. For, it makes me think of that, right? There's certain points where the veil is the thinnest. Yeah. And that seems to be what he was working on. So I said, they go through that and, and, and all this. So, uh, Tofimov, the one, the man that was inspired by this, he did a lot of remote viewing, and so he would do some experiments of, of, of with this remote viewing and not so much uh, certain areas, but more distance. He was more worried about how far he could remote view and his patients and whatnot. He could, and the times. Could you remote view in the past? Could you remote view in the future? Things like that. And he discovered that these results were more positive when the sender for this was in the far north. So in the further north he went, the sender of this knowledge, trying to send it back you know, and, and imprint on the receiver, it was stronger if he went. And which is oddly enough, because the electromagnetic magnetic field is less powerful because it's further away from the 12 vortices. Hmm. All right. Yeah. yeah, that's strange. It's really strange. And it gets even stranger. So they get together and they invent this little thing that they said would shield their subjects from all electromagnetic fields. So I'm thinking of the thing in uh, the X-Men when they wheel the doctor in the big tube where he can only see people in the ball, right? So it shields them from all this sound. So he believed that if you were in a vacuum of electromagnetic field, all right, that it you were shielded from any of that, from all of that stuff, that you could actually access all places and all times past present and future instantaneously right. that you that it's the electromagnetism is what creates these layers to keep it fuzzed out so this invention it is is it's based on what they call is kosovev's mirror and it's something that they said that thought energy is basically reflected back to the thinker and they say that the results that they got from this now of course this is if it was a legit study and nobody was kind of pencil whipping but they said that it was really astounding in the things that they had learned from this but one person did a little research later on into this and said that what's funny to them is that this thing that that they built that that Tofimov built for them to get in this electromagnetic box where they where it shields everything out mm -hmm. that there were some drawings left behind from a fella named Nostradamus and Nostradamus actually had an enclosed metal container that it is claimed that he would sit in whenever he would view into the future. And they say that looking at this chamber that Nostradamus had built, that it looks eerily similar to that that Tofimov had built. So maybe they're believing that, that, that Nostradamus just kind of got lucky and stumbled upon this in his studies and realized that if he shielded himself from that, that it helped out. So you start looking at this, you're like, huh. Well, they had a few conclusions from these experiments that Kazanev and Tofimov ended up doing over time, okay? Mm -hmm. The first one of these was, was that our planet's electromagnetic field, they say, is actually the veil. And this veil filters time and place down to our everyday Newtonian reality. That's what they've come to, enabling us to have the human experience that we're having right now in linear time. All right. Mm -hmm. And that in the absence of an electromagnetic field, we have access to an energy field of instantaneous locality and that that underlies our reality. So that's what they're talking about when we start talking about time slips with this. And they also this is what they also concluded to that once a person has accessed these altered states his or her consciousness remains so enhanced. So once you've crossed over, which might explain what, you know, some of the experiences we've had in the flotation tank, 
Might explain some of the experiences people have had when they go deep into psychedelics, like with Terrence McKenna. It might explain some of these things when people are scratching around in these surfaces. And when we talk about DMT, the spirit molecule, when they talk about maybe that's one way to get through it. I can't imagine doing a DMT trip or something like that in one of these electromagnetic shields. So, I mean, you know, no telling where you would probably end up. So, like I said, David Hatcher Childress, which he wrote the book Mapping of the World Grid. And in that book, he actually says something along these lines that we are speaking about an intelligent geometric pattern into which theoretically he says this, that the earth and its energies are organized and possibly in which the ubiquitous megalithic sites are also positioned. So he believes that they knew it. So after hearing this. I'm sure some of y'all are screaming at me right now, wanting to know where these places are. Yeah. Wanting to know the list. So, okay, I get it. Here's the list. There's vortices in what they call, okay, here we go. The Tropic of Cancer's vortices is uh, the Mohandaro site there of the Rama Empire. The Devil's Sea, known as the Devil's Triangle. There's a place near Hawaii, Hamakula. And it's the scene of very high volcanic activity. The Bermuda Triangle is in there, the Algerian megalithic ruins, and then the North Pole. Those are the vortices in there. The vortices in the Tropic of Capricorn is the Zimbabwe megaliths, Wharton Basin, which is the site of the Wallaby Fracture Zone, uh, Easter Island, the South Atlantic Anomaly, the South Pole, and the edge of the Herbides Trench near the Fiji Islands. Now, there is an even more detailed list. That goes on with this. The highest energy of these areas, it seems to be near the 31.7 degree positive or the 25 degree negative parallels north and south. Okay. Uh That seems to be the highest energy areas that people have reported these studies and done these things. Now, the five areas of, like I said, the northern hemisphere near 25 north that people believe may actually hold the doorway where you can slip through the past, the present, and the future, or, like we said, the Bermuda Triangle, all right, the Algerian megalithic ruins, they're south of Timbuktu is actually where this is at, the the Pakistan site that we talked about, the Mohandaro, okay? Uh-huh. The Devil Sea, which is there in Japan, right off the coast there of Japan, and then the one in Hawaii, the, Hama, the Hamakula there in Hawaii. Those sites are believed to be the highest in that concentration of energy. It's funny that the, the Bermuda Triangle and the Devil's Triangle and all that stuff. It's funny that those are in that area. Now, if you go the ones, now this is what I like here. In the Northern Hemisphere, near 31.7 degrees north, they believe that those are positive healing energies. So they do believe that it's like the yin and the yang on this planet. It's a positive healing or a positive energy and a negative energy, okay? Uh-huh. There has to be, right? That's the way scales work. If there's That's right. absolute darkness, there has to be absolute light. It's the way these things work. You're going to you're going to get a kick out of this when I tell you because on 31.7 degrees north and 112.8 degrees west, that's right in between Sedona, Arizona and Sonora, Mexico. Mm-hmm. And right in there is the Hopi and the Yaku, the the Yaki Indian uh, waterworks area and they said that there's a lot of magnetic anomalies happen in this area and it's also where people claim that the sedona healing vortex is so you know when we've also talked about people all the sightings that they've had in the deserts around S- sedona seeing things from the past people claim about seeing dinosaurs driving down the road look over on the horizon and there's animals over there that they've never seen before so this could be part of that that this is where there's certain areas there's a lot of these areas through here that that fall upon uh, in, in the positive energy areas, a lot of Native American reservation spots. Oddly enough, it's I, I don't you know, I'm, I'm sure we didn't put them there. I don't I don't know how it would have worked out as far as like, yeah, we're going to put them here. You know, this is the only land we're going to give them here. It's funny, but there are a lot of reservations on these areas. Also, it's also believed that Atlantis rested along one of these positive lines. The Great Pyramids rest along, or the Great Pyramid and the Pyramids, rest along this area in Egypt along these lines. And Lhasa, Tibet, and the Himalayas, which we all know we've talked about the Himalayan runners. You know, we've talked about this. The Center for Tibetan Enlightenment rests along these lines. Now, if you go further north, they say near 50 to 55 degrees north, 
There's some other ones. Findhorn, Scotland. They believe that there's some Celtic and Druid ley lines in that area. Also, Loch Ness is up around these areas. In the Ukraine, they're in Russia. There is a large Eastern Orthodox religious site, a very key site that is built on this ley line. Uh, the Indian medicine wheels in uh, Alberta around Buffalo Lake are built along these ley lines. Also, the Chubb meter cratier is on this ley line, as well as Canada's North Magnetic Pole, and it's along the Husk at, uh, Hudson Bay, also is along these lines. So you start looking at this, there's several meteor crashes along certain ley lines, this being one of them. Hmm. Now, if you go into the Southern Hemisphere, that's when you start getting down around 25 and 30 degrees south, okay? Yeah. You get down there, you start talking about the Incan culture in South America is along that. Uh, Easter Island is along there. Non Madal in Micronesia is along there. Uh, in Borneo, there's some megalithic structures at a place called Sarawak. It's built along this line. You get down there also, too. You remember when people were talking about not just the diamond mines in West Africa, but also these uh, what, what was believed to be a natural atomic reactor. Remember, people said millions of years. Well, that's along this. That's along these lines down in that part also. Really? Yes. So I'm going to discuss with y'all some of the strange sites that we've discussed on these lines. Here's one that's very interesting because we've done a little research into it. When I say we were talking about the United States did some research in it, as well as a few other countries in the UK, but it's the South Atlantic anomaly. Now it is a region of, <laughs> it's right off the, the lower coast of Brazil is where this is at. And it's a, a region of very intense radiation and they believe it's caused by a dip or they know it's caused by a dip in the earth's magnetic field over that area. Okay, so it in, and you've brought up and we've talked about numerous times the Van Allen belt. Yes. Two banded radiation field that forms Earth's magnetic field. And it's like believed to be the lifesaver, you know, helps keep things away from us is what it is. But it also traps radioactive particles that originate, you know, originate, I mean, from solar flares and, and comes in and it also stops, you know, from the solar winds. So it's there to protect us. The bands closest to Earth trap protons and the bands furthest from earth trap electrons okay so we know that they've done these studies the proton belt is 750 to 800 miles high except for one spot that's that's how far it is above our our planet except for one spot the proton belt and that's right over the south atlantic anomaly off the coast of brazil it dips down in that area to 124 miles above the surface of the earth Hmm. So they know something's up right there. Now, it shows. Now, you can go and pull it up, and you can look at some some crazy stuff that happens of real intense radiation in this area. Here's what's pretty cool. Um, American spacecraft, when it would fly, would always fly below the proton belt, but over the South Atlantic anomaly. So it would put our satellites and the space station and even the space shuttles in the path of this, right? And so you got to fly right over the top of it, but you got to because it's you know it's generated by these trapped protons in the in between of this Van Allen belt. So as the spacecraft would fly over this part, they would always report even satellites, crazy things happen, instrument malfunction. Sometimes instruments would shut down, would never come back on. It would just ruin everything, everything. So there was an X-ray observatory that flew over it in the 1990s over this little anomaly, mm -hmm. and it had uh, uh, position sensors. Okay, that had it built into it. They said that these position sensors, position, position sensors, <laughs> <laughs> had uh, if they had failed, they had uh, like like a counter, like a backup. All right, that would would help them out. So if they had like a fail safe, so if this position, knowing which way was upright on this little observatory when they flew over, if something happened, it could correct itself. Well, not only did those sensors go out as it flew over the anomaly, but the backups went out. Right. So. They were like, uh, no, it was designed for that. They made it shut its whole self down and basically fly dark through that so it wouldn't be destroyed. Mm. Because they said if it was turned on, it would never, you would, it would just, it would basically burn it out. It would tear the whole thing up. So in 1999, NASA launches the Terra Earth Observer, uh, Observing System. And that was to study climate change. That was the reason it was launched. So as the system passes over the South Atlantic anomaly, one day after it was launched, launched up there, there was a very high current passed through the motor drive assembly, 
and they said it sent the antenna into safe mode and prevented it from communicating data to tracking and data relay satellites. So it, one day in the launch went over that, and that thing just toasted it, got it where it wouldn't even, it wouldn't even communicate. That's crazy. Yeah. It would also, it, it had several satellites it knocked off. It took two weeks back in 01, there was a satellite that they sent up. It got knocked offline for two weeks before they could get it to come back on. They even know now this is what was being claimed. by. You remember when the Hubble telescope had significant gyroscope failure? Yes. And they talked about it and it was flying all crazy and they couldn't control it. It took forever to get it. They now have released it. It flew through the Atlantic anomaly, the satellite, and that's what caused it. When it went through that zone, it knocked it all offline. Hmm. Yeah. So there is a lot of things that, that tie into that. They also know that there was interrupted instrument. There was like it interrupted the instruments there and disrupted the whole thing when Space Shuttle Columbia flew through there. And astronauts even reported this, that they would see random flashes of lights with their eyes closed when they flew through there, flashing. And they believed it was particles that was so concentrated in that area that was striking the backs or the sensitive areas of the retina. Hmm. So it's it's like radiation going right, and you're seeing the radiation in your retinas even with your eyes closed. Yeah. So the South Atlantic anomaly is a real under, thing. I don't understand. Babe. Yeah, it's wild. Not only that, off the coast of Japan, there's the ex- they say it's almost exactly the opposite to the Bermuda Triangle. It's the same thing. It's called the Devil's Triangle, and it's known for paranormal disturbances. Yeah, and it, it doesn't appear on any official, they say, global maps, all right? Right. Now, it's called like Mano Umi, and it's the Sea of the Devil. And it's compared, like I said, to the Bermuda Triangle. But they do know that there has been uh, ships and even aircraft have, of course, you know, you have to say it allegedly, but they believe that they've disappeared in there, that, that they go in and they're, they're never seen once they go in there again. There have been a lot, of, you know, in air quotes, a lot lost in this area. Now, people have reported seeing UFOs, having time slips in this area, seeing ghost ships having problems with their electronic equipment, malfunctioning, everything, just tailing out, not holding together. There's even a writer named Charles Burlitz, and and he'd written about Amelia Earhart. And he believes that, you know, before, like, you know, we've had people on and discuss it, but he believed that he would try to tie Amelia's disappearance to the Devil's Triangle, that, that that's, or the Dragon, I'm sorry, or the Devil's Sea, the Dragon's Triangle, that he would tie that in there to it. There is some history around this that says that Kublai Khan, they believe, tried to make inroads into Japan, and he had failed to do so whenever he had sent ships over there because he lost his all the vessels and his crew. And they said that the numbers were hitting right up there around 40,000 men went missing back there during the time of Kublai whenever uh, he had sailed through this area trying to get to Japan. Wow. Yeah. Now, there's also some some accounts of, you know, of ghostly sightings and people saying that uh, uh, (laughs) there's been a story that they said that people like we had talked about when they'd seen the the fog, right? And things come out of it, that they had seen a traditional Japanese ship and around from the 1800s and that there was a woman sitting on the deck of it as it come out with incense burning all that. And it was almost spiritual the way that you would say, you know, something along the paranormal, but also like we talked about real like you can tell it's physically real you're not looking at a specter you're not looking at a ghost but you're also not getting the full picture of it as if you were standing right next to a ship so people have reported seeing that now like i said even burlitz even wrote a book called the devil's triangle in 1989 and he had reported that from 1952 to 54 that five japanese military vessels were lost in this triangle and that it was totaling over 700 people on those five vessels that went missing now he also wrote that the Japanese government labeled this area as a danger zone, and then the government turned right around and funded a team of scientists, a hundred to be exact, to go in there. And then, according to Berlitz, that their vessel is called the Kayu or Kayo Maru Number no. Five, and that it completely vanished in this area. And when it vanished, that the Japanese study was completely aborted, and they've never done it again. Mm. Yeah. Now, there is, you know, there's been books published about 
you know, things from the, the, the Bermuda Triangle and, you know, people saying it's not real and it's this and it's that and all this stuff. There was a fella that published a book called The Bermuda Triangle Mystery Solved, and his name was Larry Cush, and he published this in the, in the mid-90s. But he had said that uh, that these these military vessels weren't really military vessels, that they were more like fishing vessels that were lost out there and it may have been guys that were just kind of contracted to look around and they believe that maybe it was a storm right that it caused it caused this wreckage uh the japanese research vessel didn't carry they said it wasn't a hundred people that was on it or you know that that went missing these hundred scientists that it was said they believe that there was only 31 people that were actually on the ship and that it was an undersea volcano that they had that they had hit that is it's right there underwater rolling maybe they run across it at night maybe they didn't see it they're not really sure now mind you this is in 1952 when that ship went missing so they probably didn't have the best equipment to find their way around on some of that underwater things like your fish finders probably not really rocking your lore ants really ain't kicking up in 1952 <laughs> but uh they did recover some of the wreckage they said so it's funny though that people even point in some of his research because his re- research even pointed to the fact that volcanoes and seismic events and other natural occurrences they they believe this they believe that it's mainly that's what people are claiming is paranormal but the funny thing about that is is it's why is it so volcanically active in this small area in this area that's known as the devil's triangle there is a lot of I, I, without you know another term uh, earth activity as it's, you know, we're talking about a lot of volcanic and seismic activity. They say that it's even so frequent that when they say small islands, now when you take a small island, you're thinking 800 to 1,000 square foot could be considered a small island, just a little knob that comes up out of the water, then is later, you know, wiped out or destroyed or breaks off or whatever. So if you're boating through this area and you don't have the equipment like back in the day, and maybe two weeks ago you was through here and it was six feet below the water or whatnot or 30 foot below the water and you went right past it. And now the volcano has erupted and it's built a little island and you're sailing the same path roughly and you run her aground, tear the bottom out of your ship and sink that they believe that's what it's what those stories could possibly come from. But nevertheless, it still shows that there is a lot of seismic activity in this area and they do know a lot of things have gone missing and we also know that it's hard for us to get reports of a lot of missing things from japan as well as other countries so we don't really know and you got to think if it was fishing vessels that had gone out and went vanished in in this area maybe they didn't know you know they don't have a radio to radio back what are you going to send a bird you going to throw a paper airplane a letter in a bottle what are you going to do you know you sank you drowned nobody knows where you drowned but maybe you did drown in the devil's you know the dragon's triangle you know this whole thing but i like how the fact that you had brought up mysterious universe earlier because nick actually wrote a great article for mysterious universe and i'm going to read this to you about the devil's sea or the dragon triangle and it says that the experience and story of takio tada is undeniably one of the most significant on record when it comes to demonstrating that the devil's sea is a place of definitive paranormal proportions and perhaps even of otherworldly proportions, too. Okay, now you get ready for this. Y'all are going to like this. Nick writes, On a pleasant but cloudy summer's afternoon in 1971, Tata was flying adjacent to Miyaki Island when he caught sight of something incredible that loomed out of the clouds only a half a mile or so from him. It was nothing less than a definitive flying saucer. An orange-colored, gleaming, circular-shaped craft of around 70 feet in diameter and 10 feet in height that traveled in a strange, wobbling fashion as it moved slowly through the sky. Now, Tata said that seeing this unusual aircraft momentarily and hardly surprisingly flummoxed him in the extreme, and he merely sat looking at it, astonished to his very core. After a half or minute or so, However, he regained his senses and chose to do something that some might view as brave and gung-ho, and others might as undeniable, stupid, and reckless. He gave chase to this thing, folks. Now, this was a not harder thing to do, he said, for even for, for Tata's small prop-driven aircraft. And he says, after all, he said that the UFO was traveling at barely 100 miles an hour, and the main challenge was not keeping up with it, but to avoid slamming into it. So it's not speeding away. He's chasing it, and he's overpowering. He's got to be real careful. Now, it goes on, Nick writes, that fortunately, however, that the plotting progress of this flying saucer ensured that Tata was able to get close and personal 
with it, and at which point he could see that it seemingly lacked windows, engines, wings, or a tail, and was sailing through the skies near Miyake Island in what looked like near magical, but he says decidedly laid back fashion. Now Tata continued to watch with, he says, both amazement and wonder until about nine or ten minutes had gone by and this unearthly object slowly began to rise and travel in the direction of a large, dense cloud in which it finally vanished, never to resurface. Now, he says, dumbstruck by the experience and fearful of what his colleagues and bosses might say or do if he dared tell them, Tata chose, probably wisely, to remain silent on this encounter for more than 39 years. So, he was right over the Dragon Sea, right on top, or the, the Dragon's Triangle, right on top of the Devil's Sea when this happens. So I bring these things up, folks, for you to think about. We've talked about these lines of what could have possibly have been on it. If you look into these grids, you look into these earthly things, and you start getting an idea of what's built on top of them. And I've scratched the surface, because like I said, there's so many things built on top of them. But maybe there was a reason that they're there. Maybe there is something to this. I, and, and I had remembered what jogged my mind of wanting to see something like this and dig into this is I thought about finding the overlaps and then trying to look at the missing peoples that uh, Pilatus has covered and Steph Young has covered, things like that, and overlay those with some of the ley lines through the states here and maybe even other countries and see if those do, in fact, correlate because we know of things missing in the ocean, but for some reason we like to pretend there's nothing going on there, just much like we do in these state parks and, and national parks. We know there's things going missing in there, but we like to pretend it's not really going on because it didn't happen to us or we don't personally know somebody, but it is happening, and there's something that we can't seem to answer, and I had forgotten all about this until I stumbled back across it, and I think this may actually hold a few answers if we just look a little harder into it. So, folks, I hope you enjoyed the vile vortices. We're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to wrap this puppy up. Folks, you're listening to Expanded Perspectives. Vile vortices, Philly. What do you think? I mean, that's crazy. I don't know what to think. But it definitely seems like there's something going on. Well, it's one of those, if you just look at it from the surface, you're like, there's no way this is possible. This is just a bunch of bull crap, right? You're like, this, there's no way this is a real thing. But when you look back at some of the people that were studying it, like legit people, legit scientists, legit, it does seem like there's something to it. Now, look, granted, maybe a lot of it's blown out of proportion. You know, I mean, it, people like to, to bend the rules to fit their story. I get that. I understand that. You know, I think we're all guilty of, you know, telling something going on and kind of embellishing from time to time to meet our agenda. But there does seem to be something along these lines that make you think, man, it can't just all be luck. You know, they just, it just—it exactly. can't all be luck that some of these things are built on these these lines. Some of this stuff is—it always makes me think of the Coral Castle instantly when I start thinking about that stuff. Is is that's why he built it? Remember, he claimed he built it because he had to move it a little bit, so he moved it out of town. But he's—he was still in that general area that he chose a certain area to build it in. So, I don't know. It's something like I said, and I would still like to talk to David. I'd like to have him on the show, chat with him about it, see what we couldn't figure out, you know, and see what he could come up with. But I want to tell y'all something that happened to me. I had texted Kyle about it, and I didn't really elaborate on anything of it. I actually had something, if you want to call it paranormal, I finally had something happen to me that I really can't wrap my head around at all, and it happened about a week ago. And I haven't said much about it because I still like, I'm, I don't really know what it was, but I'll tell you what it was this. is I come home, and uh, I walk downstairs, and I go down to my, my the master bedroom, and then my, my wife was in the bedroom, and 
I could see the bathroom door was open, but it, it wasn't all the way open. It was like half open, half closed. There wasn't a light on, but I, I knew she'd just been in the bedroom. Like she had just seconds before. And I walk in there and I figure she's in the bathroom. And I go, hey, Cece, I go, are you in there? You in the bathroom? And I hear, yes. And I talk to her for a second. And then I hear some noise upstairs. And I'm like, hmm, up in my, up in my kitchen area up in there. And I'm like, what is that? All right, so. I walk upstairs. I get upstairs. And there's my wife in the kitchen going through some stuff. What? And I go, uh, I just talked to you in the bathroom, in the bedroom. She's like, no, I was outside in the car. I was getting some stuff out of my car. I go, no, I talked to you and you distinctly said yes in your voice loud and clear 10 feet from me. I heard you in the bathroom. And she smiled and she goes, it's finally happened to you now. And I go, what are you talking about? And she said about eight or nine months ago, she was downstairs in the den and she heard our daughter come in, open the door. She's always making noise and singing. My daughter's always bubbly and laughing and doing something. She came in, threw her keys up on the bar, bebopped in the kitchen and went in the bedroom, in her bedroom. My wife gets up to go talk to her, walks up there. My daughter's not home. Nobody's in the house but my wife. No car, no door, no keys. She said, I heard everything. Nothing there. About 10 minutes later, my daughter shows up. That's when it, yeah. So I don't know what that was. I still have no idea what that was. But I heard my wife from 10 feet away say yes, what, as loud as, and clear as I talked to her before we started, you know, before I left to go up here and record. And that's the craziest thing so far yeah i I don't i mean i know it's nothing to some people to me i'm like i know i wasn't hearing things man i know it's not like i'm it's not like i'm like i'm mistaken a a sound outside for yes i mean what that didn't happen and i still don't have an answer for it so yeah that happened to me about a week ago and i'm still dumbfounded which is not very hard to dumbfound me i mean (laughs) come on let's be honest you know i don't even know half the stuff in this office works so yeah anyhow that just some stuff that happened so yeah I thought Man, I would share this. Pretty wild. That is freaky. Right? Well, let's not forget about our sponsor, Gaia. Gaia is a video streaming service with more than 7,000 titles. They have multiple plans to choose from. They offer an annual plan, a three-month plan, and a monthly plan. Sign up now, and your first month is only 99 cents. They have feature films like Ancient Tomorrow, The Last Avatar, and Smile. They also have one-of-a-kind documentaries like Seismic Sense, Makasha Medicine, The Transformative Power of Psychedelic Mushrooms, and sacred space and the healing power of resonance. They also have perspective-changing series like Unearthing Nazca. If you've been keeping up with that little creature, that mm-hmm. three-fingered creature that they found up in Peru. There's seven episodes over there called Unearthing Nazca. It's pretty cool. And starting August 1st, there's a new series coming out hosted by our friend, the D-Man himself, Richard Dolan. It's called False Flags. Let's give it a listen. I'm Richard Dolan, and this is False Flags. If you are someone who cares about the world you live in and are interested in that elusive thing called the truth, if you're interested in true personal transformation through the truth, then maybe this is the show for you. Our world is filled with violence, bombings, acts of terror, trauma. In watching or reading the news, we almost start to think this is the normal way things are supposed to be. What I think happens is that people watch the news, say CNN, Fox, or NBC, and they get to a point where they can't take it anymore. And then they just tune out. It's too confusing, too violent, too negative. You start to wonder, why put that into my life? Tuning out from the political is part of a larger symptom, the spread of a sense of hopelessness. Many people can feel this, even if they can't always see it or put it into words. It's a loss of control, a sense that the vehicle you thought you were driving is actually being driven by someone else. It comes with this sense of confusion about the world in which the politics around us don't seem to make any sense. And there doesn't seem to be any way out. But what I am suggesting to you is that this is by design. The confusion, the hopelessness, it's not an accident. Maybe once, long ago, we might have believed that the political establishment was working for the people. Corrupt, sure, but more or less something that worked on behalf of the public. It's what our society still tells us every day, that ever so slowly we're moving toward 
greater inclusion, greater democracy, right? Well, maybe not. The confusion and hopelessness are no accident, and there is a reason for this. So this is a series on false flags and covert operations. Two questions probably come to mind. First, what's a false flag? And secondly, how do false flags and covert ops relate to what I've just been talking about? False flags are a genuine phenomenon. They are real. Sometimes people will try to tell you that false flags are tinfoil hat territory, but in fact, as you will see in this series, there have been many verified false flags. False flags are part of our world, and opening our eyes to them can help us uncover something inside us. Strength we didn't know we had. Insights that never came to us before. And the courage to evaluate our beliefs and lives in a way that can open the door for positive change, not just personally, but for society. Don't buy into the fear. It's about waking up. Very cool. So the time to sign up for Gaia is now. To get started, just go to GAIA.com forward slash expanded perspectives. All one word, no spaces. Gaia is a proud sponsor of this show, and we're more than happy to promote their service. I'll put links to it in the show notes. Cam, how's your mom doing? Well, she's doing good. By the time y'all hear this, she's probably going to be in the rehab center. She has been up trucking around. Uh, like I said, she's almost two hours away from here. Uh, I went up and saw her when it all went down, stayed with her the whole thing. And she's like, don't come back up here unless I call you. It's too far for you to drive. I don't want you up here messing around. I said, hey, look, you don't got to tell me twice. I'll see you when you get down here. But she'll have me on the phone. She's been walking. I think she's going to be dancing before she ends up getting at her. She feels so much better. Well, that's good. It is. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of problem. They tried to rebuild it the first time. It didn't take. Bones started dying. It was just a bad deal. So now she's like, I feel great. She's only complaining about a sore muscle in her butt. That's what she's complaining about. Of course, you have to see my mom, Kyle's mom. They're little bitty people. They're not real. <laughs> I think they got some <laughs> hobbit blood in them. They're not real big to start with. So anything breaks on them, it's like breaking up sticks of spaghetti. So you got to be real careful how you patch them back together. That's right. What about Pop-Pop? How's he rocking? Pop-Pop's doing good. He's going to go see his neurologist again this week to do some more tests. But I think he's okay. They put him on some anti-seizure medicine. So... I think he's all right. I mean, he looks good as he looks, expected, right? He looks as, yeah, he looks fine to me. <laughs> he looks all right to me. <laughs> if you have any stories of your own you'd like to share with the podcast, don't forget you can email the show at expandedperspectives at yahoo.com. You can call the show 817-945-3828. You can follow us on all forms of social media. And don't forget, folks, we also do another episode every Friday called Elite. You have to go to the website, expandedperspectives.com. Click on the Elite tab. Signing up is easy. It's $5 a month. You get an extra episode every Friday, as well as access to the entire back catalog, which that will be going away, uh, I think, in the next couple months. So you need to sign up for that now. Uh, Cam, what do you got planned for your week? Man, oh man, I'm trying to just get as much done as I can get before we go on vacation. That's right. You're going on vacation I'm going to be on vacation in a couple weeks. So that's all I'm trying to do is just nose down to the grindstone and just keep just pounding them out and trying to get everything done. That's awesome. I think me and my wife are planning a vacation for November sometime. Holla! I think we're going to go up uh, near Mount Shasta or something like that, do some exploring, looking for the Sasquatch. Word. We haven't been on a vacation, just the two of us, in 10 years. She's a smart lady. She don't go anywhere by herself with you. Yeah, so You it's get all be- handsy when you start <laughs> drinking. <laughs> Trust me, I know. I <laughs> uh, hope everybody has a good week for you. Elite members will be speaking to you again on Friday. Everybody else, take care. Everyone take care, not just everybody else, but everyone take care. I'm Kyle Filson. He's Cam Hale. Peace, y'all.